Hi everyone, my name is Dr. Omer Khan and today we'll be learning about leptospirosis. So leptospirosis is the third spiroketal infection which we have been, uh, which we are going to discuss now. Uh, previously we have discussed the other two spiroketes uh, which cause Lyme disease and syphilis. So today we're going to talk about leptospirosis. So guys, leptospirosis is an infection of animals and humans. It is the most common zoonotic infection in the world and it is easily transmitted from infected animals through their urine either directly or through infected soil or water. Now the way I used to like learn about leptospirosis or, or, or the way I used to remember leptospirosis was that I used to have an image and the image that helped me remember this disease was that of a surfer. Now people who surf are constantly exposed to water which can be soiled with animal urine and thus can lead to this infection. So if that helps you to remember this by all means you can use that image as well. Now it's important to remember that it can cause a self-limiting influenza like illness or a much more serious disease known as whale disease and it can progress to, to multi-organ failure with the potential for death. So it can either cause a mild infection or a, or a much serious severe form of the infection known as whale disease. So guys now let's first talk about its etiology. Now leptospirosis is caused by an infection and it's caused by a spirochete bacterium known as leptospira interrogans. Now in our previous lecture we have talked about the other spirochetes and I've already mentioned that the other two spirochetes are Trypona pallidum which causes syphilis and Borrelia burgdorferi which causes Lyme disease. Now it's important to remember that, spiro, uh, that leptospira are spiral shaped highly motile aerobic spirochetes with 18 or more coils per cell. Now, they tend to stain poorly with common lab stains and they are best visualized by dark field microscopy, silver stain or fluorescent microscopy. Now let's talk about its mode of transmission. Leptospira is most often spread through exposure to the urine of infected animals either from direct contact or from contact with soil or water contaminated by their urine. Common animals which you need to remember that transmit leptospirosis include farm animals such as cattle, pigs and horses but it can range from wild animals such as raccoons and porcupines to, to, to even domesticated dogs. There is a wide range of animals which can cause this disease but the most common uh, organisms or animals to be uh, precise are ones which I have mentioned. So now let's talk about its epidemiology because that's a bit important as well. Leptospirosis typically occurs in a temporal climate during the late summer or early fall in the western countries and the rainy season in the tropics. The incidence in the tropics is almost 10 times that of more temporal climates. It tends to be an unreported disease because its symptoms mimic many other disease processes. However, the World Health Organization has estimated that there are 873,000 cases annually with over 40,000 deaths. So you can see that there are a lot of cases reported and, and so many deaths occur as well. Now a fun fact, most notable outbreaks of leptospirosis usually occur when people participate in a triathlon where the swimming portion takes place in fresh water. So an easy way to remember the, the different risk factors of this infection is to divide them into different categories which are as follows. Number one, household exposure mostly from animals. Number two, occupational exposure, mostly seen in farmers, agriculture workers, and people working in the laboratory. And number three, recreational activities like swimming, kayaking, canoeing, surfing, and etc. So that brings us to an end uh, of our uh, introduction about leptospirosis. In this section, I have introduced the topic of leptospirosis to you. Uh, we've talked a bit about its etiology and its epidemiology and now in the next section we'll be focusing more on its pathophysiology and its clinical features which both are high yield so stay tuned to learn more about leptospirosis hi there now before we jump into the video I have a very important question for you have you subscribed to our channel if not then subscribe right now to stay updated with the latest and brand new scalia.com lectures and click on the bell icon to stay notified about new releases. We upload a full lecture every single week with some short videos sprinkled in between. So that being said, now that you've subscribed, let's return to the lecture. So 
So now let's talk about the pathophysiology of leptospirosis. Now, leptospira can invade non-intact skin and mucous membranes. The infection is acquired by coming into contact with the infected animals or their infected urine or body tissues. Sometimes leptospira can even be acquired after contact with contaminated soil and water. Historically, exposures were primarily from recreational water, but more recently, the US has seen an upswing in occupational exposures from agriculture workers. Now, all this has been mentioned in the previous section, but this is high yield to remember, so I have so I, so I have mentioned it once again. Now, when the organism is shed in the infected animal's urine, it can survive in, in fresh water for up to 16 days and in the soil for almost 24 days. They can then enter the human host through open wounds, mucous membranes, or the lungs if the infected water is inhaled. It is imperative to mention here that this infection has a propensity for pregnant women and can have devastating outcomes. It can be transmitted across the placenta if an infected human is pregnant, leading to a, uh, leading to a miscarriage in the first two trimesters. If infected during the third trimester, pregnancy can even result in stillbirth or intrauterine death. Now, once within the body, the bacteria goes into the lymphatics and then into the bloodstream. From the bloodstream, the infection can spread to the entire body but tends to settle more in the liver and kidneys, which is why in the severe form of this infection, liver and, in liver and kidney stop working and lead to fatality. It usually takes between one to two weeks for the infected person to begin to show symptoms, but could take up to a month. Keeping this in mind, let's talk about the clinical features of leptospirosis. Leptospirosis can present in two distinct clinical syndromes, icteric or anecteric. Now, the anecteric syndrome is self-limited and presents with a non-specific flu-like illness. The onset is usually sudden and can present with a headache, congenital suffusion, cough, non pruritic rash, fever, rigors, muscle pain, anorexia, and diarrhea. This illness may last a few days before resolution of the fever. This form of illness is rarely fatal and represents approximately 90% of all documented cases of leptospirosis. So, an easy way to remember the common non-fatal presentation of this disease is that the patient will have number one, red eyes, number two, flu-like symptoms, and number three, the patient will be complaining of muscle aches. So, red eyes, flu-like symptoms, and, and muscle aches. Now, the anecteric syndrome can also have a recurrence several days later and this phase is called the immune stage during which aseptic meningitis can occur. These patients can recover fully but may suffer from chronic episodic headaches. Now let's talk about the icteric phase of leptospirosis. The icteric phase of leptospirosis is, is classically known as Vale's disease. This is a severe infection and the manifestations include fever, renal failure, jaundice, hemorrhage and respiratory distress. The icteric phase may also involve the heart, CNS, and muscles. This illness is usually severe and may last weeks or months if the patient survives. So, an easy way to remember this is that whale disease or whale trashes the liver and the kidney. So, this is how I, I remembered this during medical school. So, it's an easy way to remember that the manifestations which you will see in whale disease will be from liver failure and kidney failure. Now, the differential diagnosis for leptospirosis is extremely large and varies from benign processes like viral upper respiratory tract infections, other viral flu-like illnesses, to severe infections including dengue fever, malaria, hantavirus, hemorrhagic fevers, and typhoid fever. Also consider other more common conditions which one would be likely to consider unless specific exposure history is known like cholecystitis, uh, infectious mononucleosis, primary HIV, or if unvaccinated, measles or rubella. Now, if you can remember the, the different DDs for leptospirosis, that's good enough. If you can't, no problem. So guys, that's all about the pathophysiology and the clinical features of leptospirosis. Uh, to summarize it, uh, leptospirosis causes a mild flu-like illness as well as a more severe condition known as whale disease. 
It's important to remember that if the patient is suffering from whale disease, he can have multiple symptoms. But try to remember that whale trashes the liver and the kidney. So the manifestations which you will see will be from liver failure and kidney failure. Now, in the next section, we'll be talking about how to evaluate a patient as well as how to treat a patient with leptospirosis. So stay tuned to learn more. Now let's talk about how to evaluate a patient suffering from leptospirosis. An important point to remember first off is that a high index of suspicion is required to make the diagnosis based on epidemiological exposure and clinical manifestations since clinical and lab findings are sometimes non-specific. The diagnosis is made most frequently by serological testing. Now molecular techniques are promising for rapid diagnosis but are not widely available. The, the organism may be cultured from blood during the bacteremic phase and urine after the first week, but growth may take several weeks. So to simplify this, let's list the various tools to diagnose leptospirosis. First off, we have cultures. Blood and CSF specimens come out positive during the first 10 days of illness whereas urine culture becomes positive during the second week of illness. Number two, serology. Serological tests are used frequently for the diagnosis. These can include microscopic agglutination test, macroscopic agglutination test, heme agglutination, and most common one, enzyme-linked immunosorbent assay, or commonly known as ELISA. Number three, molecular tests. This include PCR tests, and these are becoming increasingly available as they provide accurate and rapid diagnosis of acute leptospirosis. Now, because multiple organ systems are involved in this disease, other blood work may need to be done, and they may include renal and liver function tests, coagulation studies, a blood CP or a CBC, CSF analysis, and a chest X-ray. If there is a concern for aseptic meningitis in the, in the immune phase, lumbar puncture to sample the CSF is necessary and should be done. So guys, that's all you need to know about how to evaluate a patient with leptospirosis. I've tried to list down all the different ways how, which you can use to diagnose a patient. And in my opinion, that's all you need to know. So now we'll be talking about how to treat a patient with leptospirosis, which is also high yield. So stay tuned and let's meet in the next section. Now, the most important question, how to treat a patient with leptospirosis? Because we can talk about these things all day, but if we don't know how to treat a patient, then that's not going to matter much. So, the treatment of leptospirosis depends on its severity. Most experts, su most experts suggest withholding antibiotics in mild cases. These individuals will benefit from, from fluids as well as pain and fever control. However, in outpatient cases, antibiotics that may be used for mild cases include doxycycline, amoxicillin, or ampicillin. So, bottom line, if the infection is mild, no need to give antibiotics and make the patient, you know, unwell unnecessarily. Now, if the infection is severe, one may use intravenous penicillin G, a third generation cephalosporin, or even erythromycin. Patients with icteric leptospirosis usually need intensive care unit admission as multiple organs can be involved and decompensation can occur rapidly. In the presence of renal failure, corticosteroids may be helpful, but their use is, is a bit controversial to be honest. Respiratory distress due to lung involvement may require mechanical ventilation. Additional therapies include the use of ophthalmic drops, diuretics, and inotropic agents including renal dose dopamine if the patient's heart stops pumping. So to summarize, antibiotics are vital to fight the severe form of the infection. ICU admission, steroids and mechanical ventilation may also be needed. So as a doctor working in the wards, you must monitor such patients and be ready if the patient's health starts to decline. Again, the mild form of leptospirosis is rarely fatal but the severe form or whale disease as you know it does carry a high mortality rate as we already know that it affects most of the vital organs of the body as i mentioned before whale trashes the liver and the kidneys
So guys, these are, are all the high yield points that you need to know about the treatment of leptospirosis. So this brings us to an end to our lecture. I hope that you enjoyed watching the lecture and I hope after watching this lecture, you can easily talk, uh, uh, talk about leptospirosis, how to manage a patient with leptospirosis and hopefully you, you will ace your exams as well. So happy learning and see you in the next lecture. So that was all for today. Remember, we upload full lectures every week. But for more content, you can visit our website, scalia.com. We have exciting new lectures waiting for you. So go visit and happy learning.